hello good evening everybody ross here at teacher toolkit thank you for watching uh, thank you for joining live one or two of you at the moment and a few hundred maybe later on lots of people watching this later on um, i'm lucky enough to be joined by two colleagues who are going to talk about leadership and lots of different aspects of life i suppose i'm going to introduce to them introduce you both to them shortly um, so we're going to have an informal chat about school leadership and other aspects of leadership in different contexts, particularly we'll probably talk about the military in some shape or form in a moment. I'm just going to just explain this platform that we're watching off. So if StreamYard's new to you, let me just explain how it works. Um, we're currently streaming to LinkedIn, to my YouTube channel and to Twitter. So if you're logged in, you can uh, leave a comment. I'll then pop your comment on to the screen like this. So we'll just get the admin bit out of the way. So here we go. And then I can publish your comment live to our guests for them to explain and respond to. So that's the process. And um, why we're here, we're going to talk about this fabulous book. So let me just do the technology also of Leading with Love by Dr. Vic Carr, a primary head teacher in the northwest of England. I'm going to let Vic explain the book to you and a little bit more detail. So that's enough for me to begin with. Um, I'm gonna bring in Vic and Mel. Here they are. Let me just move the screen over. Good evening, Vic. Good evening, Mel. Good evening. <laughs> Let's start off with Mel. Can, Mel, can I get yourself to introduce yourself to everybody watching, please? Yeah, um, I'm Commodore Mel Robinson. So um, at the moment I'm the commander of the Maritime Reserves. Uh, I've been in the Navy um, 30 years. Um, I'm married to a naval man and I've got two adult children. Um, my son, Max, joined um, Dartmouth last Monday. Um, so I'm really proud of him. Um, I've got daughter, Maisie, and I think people probably recognise my appetite to bring up a family, um, understand how I can put them first and have a fulfilling career. So I have taken a lot of inspiration from Vic's book and I'm delighted to come here this evening to have a chat about bits of that that I think are as applicable in the military as they are in schools. Thank you. Well, thanks for joining uh, us, Mel. I'm really looking forward to he hearing some of your insights. You sound like a very busy lady. Um, so I'd be interested to learn how you balance leadership, life uh, and being a mum and also life in the ministry. Um, Vic, over to you. Tell us, uh, tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I am, as you said, a primary school head teacher in the northwest of England. Um, I run a brilliant school called Woodlands Primary School, and I've been there. This is my fifth year. It's my second headship. Um, I absolutely love it. Equally, I love my reserve career. I'm an army reservist. I'm uh, an officer in the army reserve. And I think that what Mel said is really interesting because I definitely see the resonance between what we do in schools and the military. I think leadership is leadership no matter your context. And hopefully that's that's what we'll chat about this evening. Now, there's a small matter, uh, just for people listening, uh, we can't talk about it, but Vic's just gone through Ofsted, literally and <laughs> finished now, but we're going to quickly move on from that topic. Okay. Uh, small, small matter, uh, You've published the book, Vic, haven't you? Now, that's not uh, a, a small achievement. It's a massive achievement. Tell us, uh, tell us when it was published and how it, the book came to be. Okay, so this isn't really a tricky topic, although looking back, it perhaps might sound a bit bizarre. So <clears throat> I do lots of bits in the margins of my day job, as I'm sure most of us do. And one of those things is I'm often asked to talk to um, student teachers or emerging leaders, perhaps on master's programs and what have you. So I was asked during lockdown to talk to um, a bunch of students from Hope University in Liverpool, which I did online. And I was asked to talk about my leadership journey. And I thought, actually, that's pretty boring because everyone was learning online. Nobody really wants to know about all the schools you've worked in, um, you know, in terms of a linear progression. So I just thought rather than prepare anything i'd talk off the cuff and i would talk about um some of the key learning that i'd taken away and i distilled it probably into about 12 tweets on the back of that those sort of tweets post the talk 
um, loads of people interacted with it and someone suggested I write a blog and from there it became why don't you extend that blog into writing a book at which point I did what I always do and tried to talk myself out of doing it because I thought <laughs> oh, who writes a book that's impossible that's beyond me um, and I then was asked to fill in a kind of some you'll know you'll be familiar with this a proposal yeah. and I thought about it for a number of weeks and thought oh my life I don't know how to do this and then breaking down the um kind of tweets into chapter headings really I just kind of created a blog around each idea and so it evolved from a small idea into a kind of bigger one and then I found actually that when I was thinking about each topic and I think I might say this in the book when I was thinking about each topic as if I was writing a blog I almost thought um, about all the different things that contributed to that aspect of my development, the aspect of my life or my leadership or my family or what have you, and just expanded on it. So it's not really, I think I say, it's not an academic book. I am a doctor. I've got a doctorate, um, an academic one. So it's not like that at all. So if people are, are thinking, oh, that's going to be a boring book because she's a boring doctor, I think it's less about that and more about just a few bits. I mean, having, uh, no, having got a copy... <laughs> There's lots of lovely stories in, so we're going to unpick some of the stories from each chapter okay. lately. Um, but before I do, um, Mel, you mentioned earlier that you loved this book and it resonated with you a lot. So give us a kind of overview of as, as to why um, why it made uh, touched you so much. Okay, so somebody that enjoys learning by doing. Um, and so uh, a good book in my life is often reflected by um, how many pages I've turned over, which bits I've scribbled on, which bits I've highlighted, um, where the most thumbed bits of this book are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what I most enjoyed about it, Vic, was the, um, was the opportunity to reflect at the end of each chapter and go back um, and immerse yourself in bits of, um, uh, uh, bits of your experience that, You've recorded whether it be a podcast or a book. I've read this. Go back, go and read that. So you just continue to get further and further immersed in the learning from each of the chapters. So learning by doing is what I'd say, Ross. Is it's it's very engaging and um, yeah, kept kept on going back to it. It's brilliant. Great. So I'm I'm pleased to hear that you are a, a kind of underliner. Some people don't like to deface books, but I'm very <laughs> much a highlighter and writer in it too. Um, yeah. Vic, have you written in your copy? Um. If I'm really honest with you, and again, you are the expert. Um, once you've written it and you've edited it and you've reread it and you've proofread it, you're kind of a bit put off <laughs> picking it up again. But I, I do agree that is what I do, and I think I, I do say it in there that if you're the kind of person who it's got red wine stains or it's got coffee stains because you put your your red yeah. wine on it and then you go back. I, I don't like to do Facebooks, but I like to live them. Right. And, and I mean, you, can, I listen, you know, the more audible books are listened to, you can't pick them up and you lose them and you, you don't get that kind of authenticity over time. So um, get writing on them, I say. Um, I'm going to come to some more questions just for people watching live. We're live streaming to LinkedIn, uh, Twitter and YouTube. Pose a question in the comment box. I'll press a button on my side. So here we go and I'll display your question for us to respond to. So let's just get warmed up. So there's a few people watching live. Maybe just log in and tell us where you're watching from uh, on your sofa, hopefully a glass of wine or something like that. Relaxing, depends on when you're watching this and where you are. We know people can watch from anywhere. Uh, Vic's got a glass of champagne, quite rightly. This is a book launch, and she <laughs> has just survived Ofsted, but I'm not going to mention that. Um, I'll, I'll try not to we'll probably say it a lot well, of times. I'm still really. smiling, so um, <laughs> I think you can take from that. Yeah, well, there you know. go. Well, people in the game will will, will read between the lines. Um, now, I'm going to put this, Vic, up just to give you a prompt. So we've got your kind of what, why, how methodology. Now, you've also explained how the book came to be. So mm -hmm. let's just go to the why. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... I guess like a lot of people, particularly if, if you've got a, a much bigger social media presence than me, you, you're often asked about what's the secret? How do you um, how do you survive leadership? What's the secret to being a good leader? Um, and lots of people evidently assume that I was one. So I thought, am I actually? So I thought I'd kind of try and debunk some of the myths mm -hmm. surrounding leadership and make sure that everybody realized it was a really accessible thing and that um, it was possible for anybody who aspires to it. It was possible because I think 
my 101 of leadership is reflect on yourself, what you bring to the party, be honest with yourself, have some emotional intelligence. And if you don't have it, then learn to develop it. And there's loads of ways you can do that. Mm-hmm. And um, also just to call, call, like I say to you, call, call to arms everybody who um, may not even see that they are a leader. So anybody who has got influenced or who is influential in any way, be that, um, you know, social workers or people working in youth clubs or whatever, if you're working with other people and you have influence over their lives, then you are a natural leader. Um, and that means that you have got the opportunity to really, truly change lives. And I don't suppose many people think that they can or that they would. And some of those realizations have kind of come to me over time. So I thought, why not? Given the fact that I've been asked to do this book, given the fact that I'm doing it and I'm immersed in it, why not sort of give some people um, an idea of, of, of why they might want to do that? So it just is, a, is an extension, really, of um, of what I talk about in my, in my TED Talk. And uh, for people watching, if you're not familiar with uh, Vic's TED Talk, go to her Twitter profile. We'll, we'll put that link in the in the feed shortly. You can watch uh, Vic's TED Talk later. Um, delighted that Nina's joined us and been brave enough to leave a comment. So everyone else tuning in, do so also. Uh, an ESOL teacher in Argentina. Fantastic. So thank you for watching um, there. Uh, feel free to post some questions, Nina, as we go through the session. Now, Vic, let's go back to the beginning. We all need a good story to get our neurons <laughs> activated. So I'm going to put these two provocative pictures on. And Mel and I are just going to disappear behind the scenes and leave you solo for a little, <laughs> just to tell a little story. So um, over to you. Tell us about the beginning. OK, so um, what's hilarious, I think, and, and I don't know if any of you can see this, but the photo of me, I'm in the stripy T-shirt and my face has not changed in 40 years there. So um, I'm with my brother and I'm with my sister who's one down from me. I actually have two sisters, but this is a photograph, um, one of the few photos that survives our childhood. So in the beginning, um, the earth did definitely cool, but um, for us, it was a bit of a a challenging time and our smiles there, are kind of our armor really we we were always smiling and and, you know thick as thieves and up to mischief and the four of us together but there aren't many photos that survive our childhood because my dad um who had schizophrenia and was quite a violent chap he decided that he would try to kill himself on a number of occasions and one of those occasions was when he got all of our family photos out um he was obviously feeling very melancholy and he got all the photos out and he slashed his wrists and destroyed most of our family photos. So there are very few photos that exist of our childhood, particularly of my baby sister. Um, And I think, to be honest with you, my siblings would probably try and throttle me if they knew that this photo was out in the public domain because, um, yeah, that was definitely 70s fashion. But um, that was the beginning for us. But it shows that it exemplifies for me the love I have for my family and the love I have for my siblings and just um yeah they're they're just great they're they're great kids and we've all grown up um caring for one another and, and in a very close um close family relationship which is the underpinning of everything that I do and that that then led me to become the kind of superwoman idea that most people think I've got now and that outfit that superwoman get up that, that came to me. <laughs> so one of the things I brought to this current school was supervision. I think right. modern leadership now, we deal with a lot of challenging yeah. social stories. Now, my story was a challenging social story, but back in the day, in the 70s, we didn't have the support networks that we have now in schools to support children like we were. And one of those um, groups of people that we have now, fantastic um, kind of, car- you know, caring for children in social care and that kind of local area support. That's the lady who um, brought me that superwoman costume. She's a great old girl and um, great young girl actually. And she she brought me that costume. She said, I think about you all the time and this is how I view you. I don't know her that well. Um, <laughs> she came to our school and said, honestly, this is how I view you. And I was just so thrilled. So I wore that the whole day. The kids thought it was great. The staff thought I'd lost the plot. They actually know I've probably lost the plot, but right, I just thought. So, so that's do. very. I guess this is very much your why here, isn't it? Um, I'm going to pop yeah. over to Mel. Mel, I guess in the same context. I know we don't have a slide to show, but can you think back to a time in your beginning? You know, your early life, your first career, where that why journey started for you to a point where you are today. 
Yeah. Um, middle of my career, Ross, actually. Um, I had a um, an interesting sort of moment when I fell pregnant in the military. And in those days, we didn't have um, policies in place for us to have careers and have children. Um, and so I left. And, and in leaving, um, I, I lost my uniform. And rightly or wrongly, I'd credited my value system to my uniform. Um, right. I'd come through Dartmouth at that stage. And in, in kind of leaving the Navy to have the kids, I, I, I kind of had this sort of emotional moment um, where I just lost my sense of self and mm -hmm. I had to rebuild that. Um, and I re rebuilt it through a very personal journey of commitment to self um, and personal development, which has made me the leader that I am today. Mm -hmm. so I think I'm quite different in my second career as a reservist than I perhaps was in my first career. I think I am. Maybe people will tell me yeah. I'm not the same. I don't know. Um, and I guess so there was lots of highs and lows along the way and kind of critical moments, you know, turn left or turn right type stuff. Yeah, I mean, listening to people there talking to her, photo, you know, photographs, you said, you know, the smile was the armour. Of course, we have a uniform that normally sort of, uh, does a lot of the sort of leadership and direction for us. Um, and so compassion and empathy is something that you've really got to work at, hard mm -hmm. at, to, to shine beyond that sort of um, that austere sort of uh, way in which we present ourselves, I think. So I guess, you know, out of my expertise a little bit, but and I know we're far from perfect yet, but I'm hoping policies are a little bit better for females in the military today than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Absolutely. Um, uh, we're, we are in a completely different place. Um, so in the 20 years that I've had the kids, I've seen women have a completely different experience in the Navy, yeah, and, and across the military. So very, very different place to what it was um, 20, 20 years ago. Um, moved on leaps and bounds, definitely. Good. Well, that, that's good to hear. And thank you for sharing your why. So just to remind people watching live, we are in a book launch, but we're going to be sharing lots of stories. Let me just put this back up on the screen for you. We're talking about Vic's new book, Leading with Love, you know, Compassionate Leadership. Uh, I suppose today it's very relevant, Vic, Jacinda Arden. You're maybe education's version here in England of Jacinda Arden, I would like to say. Um, wow. Um, that, they're big <laughs> bits to fill, Ross. Let's just get that out there. But I, well, I saw you know, that so some exactly. of the things that she said, you know, we think about lots of people like yourself that do lead our schools with compassion and love. It is possible and it is possible to get good Ofsted outcomes uh, through that leadership, as you can probably attest. But we'll move on from Ofsted. Uh, I've put on slide two. Um, so chapter two is about courage. So give us a synopsis, Vic, of this slide and a reminder to everybody. Um, we've had a comment from Nina so far. Log in, leave us a question or a comment. We'll put them on display and we'll respond to you as we go through. So we're talking here about leadership and compassion. So Vic, slide two, what have we got here? Okay, so building on from my why and building on from the little snapshot I told you about the first chapter, about the beginning. So we didn't have a great start, but the people who guided me in the very beginning were in schools um, pretty much my teachers and the teaching assistants. And actually, I think I said in my TED talk, when I went back to my primary school, almost 40 years later, there was one person who was still there from when I was there as a small child. And um, she was amazed to hear about the stories of myself and my siblings and, and even my mum really, and, and what we'd gone on to do with our lives. And I think, you know, my career was always destined to be with children. Although I wanted to fly helicopters, um, which was my big passion as a teenager. I just didn't have the courage to do it. I think I do talk about that in the book. I just didn't have the courage and I didn't have someone who was advocating for me and telling me to go out and get everything I wanted and reach for the stars and don't care if you fall before that. Um, and now I'm a mum and I think my children, and they're here, there's my gorgeous boy Tom and my best girl is, and look how great they are, they're just adorable. Um, my son, a little bit like Mel's, is um, is off, is in the army now, and uh, he's trained to be a royal engineer, and my daughter's um, just doing her A-levels. But I think having them means that I not just have found courage um, to kind of share my story, 
but also to support my children and to make sure that they have have got the courage from me and that has involved me working on myself because I did not want my children to have the same insecurities that I had or or ever feel that they weren't good enough or um, yeah. feel afraid or what have you so they they give me the courage and I talk in that chapter about lots of reasons why I've developed courage which I won't bore anybody with now if you yeah, want well, to actually, I'm going to interject because I'm flicking through the things that I've highlighted and we've got your daughter you know like all children you know my boy had a meltdown during lockdown uh, no surprise yeah. so I suppose all our children have that at some point as they grow up we talk about you know marriage and uh, you know children surviving in all sorts of contexts. You've got a really good question. Uh, well, a good, a good statement here. Don't hide from painful situations. Uh, tell us what you mean by that. So basically, for a little while, I thought that I needed to protect my children from any pain because I had felt pain as a child and I didn't want them to feel any pain. So I thought that was the best parenting strategy to protect them from that really but what that did was kind of sanitize life and in fact I realized very quickly going through my divorce that perhaps that wasn't the best strategy really because they need to know and understand feelings and emotions are normal they're part of life and it's how we then deal with some of those tricky I hadn't had that parenting experience when I was parented when I was a child Mm -hmm. I didn't have that so I didn't really have that roadmap so I have given that to my children and but that came from them my son and my daughter kind of said to me we need to see that you're upset mommy because this is really sad and and I I said well I am upset you know I, I try and do it all away from you to protect you and they said we don't need that we need you to show us because then we know that you feel like we do and so then I would explain to them and I think that taught me that actually it's okay to feel these feelings that normal human feelings grief is normal pain is normal and explaining how that might look and how we might recover from that and the tools that we might use to recover from that will help my children find that language and those tools themselves which it has done um and uh you know as, as you as you describe in, in parts of the book you know that some there's some kind of deep uh there's you know lots of deep sharing here and you know lots of honesty so if people have not got their hands on on this great book uh, leading with love you wear your heart and your sleeve vic and it, it can be it must be commended and um, before i come to mel and ask you the same question about courage your own children and lessons in leadership just want to say thank you to kimba in uganda for watching uh, us live also and just a shout out to Nina in Argentina, Yanina. So thank you both for joining us. Um, anyone else who's brave enough to log in and leave a comment, let us know where you're watching and get brave enough to ask us some questions in a moment when we talk about leadership and compassion. Mel, over to you. Um, question, I guess, you know, my son's 11. I've already had one or two quite significant moments, one when he was born, and I guess one during lockdown, if I think about courage parenting leadership you know and being a being a dad but what about for you in terms of it shaping your own destiny and how you're bringing your children up any kind of key things that stand out so i love that we're on chapter two aren't we courage i love this chapter um <laughs> because um it talks to to resilience and there's a there's a point later in the book where you talk about um success not being a linear pathway and for me definitely I had I had plateaus in my career and I had these big surges where I made sort of progress through the through the hierarchy very, very quickly. And that caused some resentment in the organization. Um, and so I've personally suffered um, from that. Um, and I kind of got to a stage where I thought, you know, you, you can either be a victim to that behavior um, or you can learn from it. So your your point at the end of this chapter change the narrative from why is this happening to me to what is this teaching me? I was always very clear with my with my kids. They could see me suffering. Um, I wasn't quite as brave Vic, in terms of hiding my tears, but I was very clear with them about taking the lessons and, and understanding how I could be sort of more, more resilient. I think one of the points I'd make is, um, of course, we're strong women, okay? So, yeah. so the, the challenge with being... Uh, strong in that in the household is that there's always a risk you're going to over, over mother your kids um and so i've had to work quite hard with the kids to to introduce resilience to them and encourage them to take their own journey um so you kind of have to soften down the sort of strength and the superwoman at home don't you to allow them mm -hmm. to sort of develop themselves but yeah resilience this chapter for me was all about you know it's not it's not a linear pathway you're going to come across some real hurdles 
in your life and your career and you either become a victim or you become somebody that does something about that. Um, so I took a lot from this chapter. Thank you, Vic. My question about resilience, you know, we often have to draw upon resources around us and either we have those resources or we learn through adversity and hardship and we don't have them and they're either signposted to us or there's a bit of grit inside us, whether it's, we call that DNA or something else. I, I, I don't know what the question is, but I'll pose it to you, Vic, first because you've written the book. What, what advice would you give to people out there that might be struggling who may not have an immediate resource network? So, for example, I've moved up to... Uh, I've left London after 30 years. I'm in Yorkshire. Apart from my family, I don't know anyone. <laughs> um, so you have to obviously draw upon all the skills you have and accumulated over time. But you know, maybe for someone starting out in their career like you two were, I won't say however number of years because I'll get in trouble. But um, <laughs> you know, whenever you were started, what would have, what advice would you give to yourself? Best, I guess that's the best question for someone that doesn't have the resources. What should they have? What what would what 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 would you told yourself to have done? But it's really tricky, isn't it? Because um, when I kicked off my career 25 years ago, um, we didn't have the kind of tools that we have now. So all of my new teachers now, I encourage to use social media. I know that there are risks with social media. I do. However, there are also great benefits. And honestly, I only set up my Twitter account when I joined my new school. So I've been there for a bit years. And there are lots and lots of people that I've networked with since who have just provided me, an experienced leader, with a huge wealth of support and ideas and um, friendship and collaboration opportunities. And, and I retweet ECT questions. I will, I'm, I'm, my DMs are open. Again, this is dangerous. Um, I won't say as a woman, I just think as a human being because there are all kinds of um, people with peculiarities who think it's okay to say um, inappropriate things. But there are methodologies that you can use to challenge that and block and, and report and all of those things happen. What I would say is reaching out on social media so many people now, and, and as I said earlier, it goes back to, to my belief system, which is somebody like me who now finds themselves with a few followers on Twitter, I will amplify um, the questions of people to support them. So, you know, who can I turn to? I'll amplify that, even if, even if it's somebody obscure or somebody unknown to me, because I think that's our social and moral obligation to kind of support people who are new and young and vulnerable and perhaps a bit worried. And I'm also open to people asking me questions or ask me for advice. I spend a lot of time um, responding to people or at least signposting them towards yeah, where I they guess are. that's the power of social media. You know, none of us yeah. had that, you know, 15 We didn't years have that. Ago. Yeah, no, no, we and, didn't uh, have it. It was local authority training and all that was it. And that's all you were told <laughs> and, and got on. Uh, Mel, how about yourself? You know, what advice would you give to yourself starting out if you didn't have a resource network around you? Uh, younger, younger self. So... Um, I was, as you do, reading sort of about um, intelligent quotients earlier this week. Sorry, it's the dog coming in now. Um, <laughs> bring, the, bring the dog in. Let's have a look. <laughs> DQ. I mean, isn't that a thing? How to use social media to to, to yeah. influence? Um, how to how to uh, assess and understand people that you're connecting with through that environment that you don't, you're don't, you not seeing them visually. So I think it's a lot diff, more difficult, Vic, to understand who you're going to reach out to. Yeah. Um, advice to my to my younger self, ask for help. So when you are dr leading a purpose-driven life and when you want to contribute and help people, it's really, really hard to ask for that help yourself. Mm -hmm. um, 100% agree. Quite, quite, quite late. Um, and actually, once I've learned to do it, um, I, I think now I'm more inclined to go with my instincts, and when I when I need um, when I need to reach out, I just go for it, and I'm mm -hmm. a better person for it. Good mm -hmm. tips. Uh, reminder, people watching, if you've got questions about leadership, female leadership, leading with compassion and love, um, then pose those questions in the chat box. So we've got quite a few people that are joining us, so I'm going to give them all a, a little shout out again. So Yanina joined us from Argentina. I hope you're still watching. Um, Kiembe from Uganda. So we've got a true international audience, yeah. Aliyah, Pakistan, and Sarika from the UK. Whereabouts, Sarika? And great to hear of us from a science teacher. Um, now, there's 15 chapters in this brilliant book, Vic, and I'm referring to our slides that we've prepared. So we're skipping to chapter four, and I'm going to put this. In fact, before we go there, let's just give a quick shout out to chapter three. Do what is right, not what is easy. Give us a 30-second synopsis 
of what's in that chapter? What can people expect? I think it talks about moral courage and about um, taking a deep breath and stepping forward and doing the right thing. And sometimes it is not easy to do the right thing. There are lots of easy options, softer options, not taking the difficult conversation when you need to, um, not tackling that that issue. And actually, I've learned over time that it's better to do that, better to tackle the difficult problem, better to have the difficult conversation than to let it rankle on, even if it's a bit difficult. Yeah. And it is. And, you know, we make mistakes along the way and we have those awkward conversations. I guess what we don't want to do is have casualties along the way. No, that's quite right. And what I've learned and how I how I work with my leadership team, again, it's commented on this evening in our feedback as a strength is to coach them. And um, you can't have innovation and drive and energy without mistakes. And I think your response as a leader when mistakes are made is absolutely crucial because you can't encourage that innovative um, environment if you then um, come down like a ton of bricks on people who are being innovative. And that is going to involve mistakes. And we teach it to children. And I guess I see it in the military, you know, when I went through Sandhurst 18 months ago, if we made mistakes um, in certain ways, we were then shown a different way and we were coached. And that that is the... Um, the absolute model now that, that the British Army and I suspect the Navy when I was doing my research that their ideas and their way of the methodology of, mm -hmm. um, of disseminating the information is now much more about a coaching methodology and an expectation right. that people will make mistakes. Now, Mel, I can see we've been joined by a special guest on your lap. Uh, <laughs> Still on the show. <laughs> um, so, Mel, have you got one kind of point in your career where you had that difficult moment and you did what was right, you know, not what was easy? Anything stand out? Yeah, so this, so, you know, the, your brand is um, is what people say about you when you're not in the room, yeah? So I think uh, this chapter for me talks about, um, talk about talk, talks about consistency and you talk about leaving a legacy, Vic, in terms of what, in terms of what you say. Once those words are said, you can't ever, ever take them back. Um, and being consistent is really, really tough. And, and I think what comes across in all of these chapters is good leadership is hard work. It's hard work developing yourself. Um, but but and, and I think it comes through in the next chapter. My breakthrough moment, Ross, was um, understanding that I wasn't always going to get the help from my own sector. So I've turned to the education sector in particular okay. to, to connect with senior leaders who can teach me a lot about how to be a better leader in the... Um, oh, that's in the interesting. And I suspect in any industry, we've got, you know, thousands of people out there that don't get the help they need from their own industry. And I hope that there's a bit of a better network in the military, at least with the leadership yep. to support people today. Right. Let's whiz on to chapter four. So people watching or just tuning in, we're looking at a book launch here, Leading with Love um, by Dr. Vic Carr. Um, who are these two gentlemen, Vic? So these two chaps are two of the greatest loves of my life, um, alongside my children. Um, on the left-hand side in the red braces is Johnny, and on the right-hand side is Richard. And um, all I can say is that I am a product of the people who have invested in me over my life. And Johnny um, runs a pub, still does, in Ambleside called The Golden Rule. I cut my teeth in there as a student and I and I think I out myself in the book when I say that I was really socially inept and I was terrified of life and in working in Johnny's pub I had this pseudo social life when I was at university and everyone talks about this wonderful experience they have at uni and how you know they're out socializing and everything that was not my story because I just wasn't equipped with the right social skills and the right um confidence to do that and often what surprises me is that people are, are shocked that that would be the case because I can come across as being quite um, buoyant and, and bubbly and what have you. But, uh, you know, as a teenager, that was not the case. Um, I've become myself in, in my 40s. And um, so Johnny used to say to me, let's go for an adventure. And in the book, I talk about some of our adventures, one of which was us crashing um, in Grisdale Forest in a, in a balloon accident, which was just hilarious, uh, if not slightly death defying. And Richard um, was just, is just an amazing guy. So he was my lecturer at Charlotte Mason College, as was uh, University of Cumbria, as is. And he taught me about experiential learning, about nature, about connecting with nature. And he would often quietly hand me books about self-help. He could see that I was um, 
struggling and he, he knew that reading was my passion so he would just give me books to read so Robert Frost and um, The Road Less Travelled and things like this and I would read these books and, and through sheer determination which I do have in spades as it happens I read these things and just I found myself and I thought it's okay you're okay you'll be okay and I found mantras to kind of help myself through so those two guys weren't just instrumental in me getting through college they were instrumental and still are. I love them both. I see them both regularly now. Johnny's just back from a trip in Mexico. And Richard actually is um, halfway through writing his book. I talked to him at the weekend. So oh, I see they're very much right. in the next characters. slide. We've got a picture of you at probably at this point in your life, but we won't come to that just yet. But we'll give everyone a little teaser of what's to come. <laughs> Um, I've got a really interesting comment from Sarika, who's watching us from the West Woodlands. And Mel, I'd like, maybe you'd like you to respond to this one. So it's very pertinent in terms of the things that we're discussing. So I'm based in the West Midlands, just had a baby. Not don't want to let it stop me moving up. And how do you know if you're ready to take on more responsibility? So a really, really good question. And we know still in our society, and it's going to take a bit of work still, but you know, you're female, you take your maternity leave. Your career can take a bit of a, a U-turn sometimes. So what, what advice, Mel, could you give to Sarika? So, Sarika, I had the benefit of working uh, in an organisation that um, appraises its people well. We invest a lot of time in um, performance management. And there have been occasions in my career where I lacked confidence and my seniors in my reporting cycle were, was, were, were telling the system that I was ready to step up the ladder and not once have I promoted and find that I've stepped up the ladder and people have got it wrong. So, uh, and, and I think after I'd had the kids and as I was coming back into the working environment, I probably relied on performance appraisal more than I ever did. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage you to work with your line managers and challenge them to take take responsibility for you take responsibility for yourself and have that sort of shared conversation because there comes a time where the organization has to work with you as a young man to a, a young woman to um to bring you on um but a good a, a good appraisal system is what i'd say there fantastic and having gone through investors and people as a school leader it's a brilliant system for all school leaders watching to kind of test the robustness of your processes your hr processes your staff mm -hmm. development uh, looking at all aspects across anonymously, um, it's a very good process. And appraisers is often a good litmus test. You can have the best systems on paper, but it's the people that bring it all to life that matters. So, Sarika, thank you for sharing such a important and personal question. Um, Vic, let's go to Chapter 8. So here we've got a beautiful picture of you a um, couple of years ago. Um, getting you... <laughs> What, what year was this? Let's let's just unpick, let's unpick the truth. What year? I think that was three years ago. Um, it's for but your... I'd, had, I'd had my makeup done. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that because I'm really rubbish at makeup. Like my daughter's trying to teach me how, right. but I'm positive failure at the makeup side. Anyway, so... This so is for your doctorate, yes? Yeah, 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 it was. So that was three years ago. Um, and you know what? I absolutely love doing my doctorate. It was a labor of love, obviously. And I would say anyone keen to do it. So, OK, if you've done a degree, that's like doing a 10K. If you want to do a master's, it's like doing a half marathon. And I would liken a doctorate to doing a marathon. I don't know what you feel, Ross. I know you've done a doctorate. Oh, I feel like there's a no, massive... I haven't. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with mine. Um, I found my MA super easy, actually. Um, like the doctorate half marathon, is another level. <laughs> it's another level <laughs> yeah so it's quite the challenge and I feel like it's just about that staying power because when I'd, I've run two London marathons so I kind of do have the analogy in my head and it feels right for me but there were times when I did the second one not long after I'd had a double mastectomy and I thought oh my god I have got nothing nothing in me I'm gonna pack in I can't I can't do this and nobody will think badly of me so I have this kind of one voice on one shoulder saying just pack in no one will think badly 
But then, like I said earlier, I'm super determined. So on this side, I was thinking to myself, you are not giving up, car. You are going to run to the next purple balloons. You will run to that next lamppost. And that's what got me through those final two to three miles. And I feel like it was the same feeling when I did my dog trip. And yeah. everyone thinks that you must be super clever or super amazing, and I'm really not. Well, I'm going to highlight a key chapter here, and I'm going to pose some questions to Mel about her own learning journey. But there's a key okay. chapter in this section, overcoming barriers to studying part-time. So you're a mum, you're a head teacher, you're a busy, yeah. busy lady with children. It's uh, it's super tough for ladies out there, uh, more so than men. So how what what tips are you going to offer to other female uh, uh, watchers? You know, just generally doing things part time on top of the day job and on top of being a mum. What 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 key advice? Is that for Mel or for me? That's for you first, Vic, and then I'm going to come oh. to Mel about what you've been learning, Mel. So we'll, I'll pose that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay so I think I talk a little bit about this so obviously I do not have a time turner I am not Hermione Granger from Harry Potter so what I do is compartmentalize my time and, and I prioritize really well so I know as I embark on something that it is going to take time and I know that something will give and sometimes I, I think I say it it's my social life sometimes or um you know, my TV or whatever. And I just accept that I'm going to have to compartmentalize for a short space of time, it's time limited, and that the benefits of doing so will far outreach the uh, the limitations of doing that. And, and it, I think I talk about balance as well in the book. I can't remember, I'm a bit tired tonight, but definitely there has to be balance, but at times the balance is, is skewed. And, you know, you know yourself doing a doctorate, you know, I was in the books on a night time, the children were in bed, I would be working until midnight and then I'd be in school. The TV wasn't on for about four months, which I accepted. Um, and that's what I say, compartmentalize, be ruthless with your time management and, um, you know, prioritize what is important to you. Yeah. I mean, I know I, for my doctorate, I just haven't prioritized enough time for it and found that regular slot. And I suppose COVID was a bit of a distraction. <laughs> Um, Mel, how about you? What what have you learned recently? Any kind of critical learning points in your uh, career yeah. uh, where things were a bit tough? What were you doing at the time? So, um, so I did my master's degree with the Open University, and and I think when I look back at um, what what inspired me on those sort of Christmas eves, three three years consecutive to um, to keep working, was setting a good example to my kids. Right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to instill in them a love of learning. And um, my 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 master's degree graduation is is right up there in terms of what in things I have achieved, mm -hmm. and, I, and I've achieved a lot. But that that one actually is the one you know. There's a photograph downstairs. I kind of think I love that day. I really love that day. Um, um, every day is a learning experience for me. Um, yeah. I absolutely embrace um, feedback loops. Um, I sit down with my deputy after not every serial, but most serials and saying, how did that go? What do we do well? What can we do differently next time? And yeah. I think the points I'll make here, Vic, is that there's points in the book where I, I'm reading your stories and I'm kind of thinking, you're superwoman. Um, um, absolutely amazing. Your resilience and determination really, really comes across. But what comes across more than anything is your humility. And I think that yeah, as I... The as Jacinda I, Arden of the education world, I'm telling you now. And as I become <laughs> more and more senior, what's, what am I learning now? Actually, every day is a learning experience. And, yeah. that, and that humility in senior leaders is what people want to see. They don't want to see the super person. They exactly. want to see the, 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 the human side of just working hard. And, and this brings us on to the next important chapter. But before I do, here we've got a great comment from Kiimba in Uganda that I'm so inspired by Vic for a zeal and resilience to make it the career dream. So there you go, Vic. Um, inspiring <laughs> people. Now, the next chapter we've got here is an important one for us all because – you know, in education, I suspect Mel in military, the conversation about mental health was never had, you know, 10 plus years ago. And you'd struggle to find any reference academically to kind of research on good mental health, improves academic outcomes for our children. But it's now in abundance. So, uh, Mel, tell us about this slide. Uh, sorry, uh, Vic, tell us about this slide first and I'll come back to Mel. Um, OK, so I'm a big advocate for uh, supporting my staff again good news tonight uh, with the office said feedback was that that came through in leaps and bounds unusually so on the staff questionnaire nearly 100 staff every single one 
uh, said they felt supported and, and so on, which is actually probably my biggest success in the last few years. Um, so this is me at the gate to my school and I'm carrying a yeah, medicine ball. It's medicine a medicine ball. ball. It's right. chained to me. I'm wearing a ha handcuff to my, uh, my hand. It's a med ball challenge. It's a, it started off by a chap in the army, Andy Unwin, and it's meant to signify um, how difficult it is to carry around a mental health issue. So I did that. That was, again, this is me bridging the, the military um, education, yeah. you know, peace building thing, because um, everyone asked me about that. The children asked me about it at my school. And um, how long did you carry it around for? A week, seven days, wow. of my life, my wrist. Oh, I mean, it was only three kilos, but the the, the handcuff, the chain, yeah. how difficult, yeah. you know, just managing everything, even making a cup of tea was a challenge. So, and exactly the point, that is how people feel if they struggle with mental health. And my whole adult life, I've tried really hard to manage that and how it impacts on me because of my childhood. So obviously I told you before, my dad had um, was schizophrenic. His mental health issue contributed significantly to the difficulties that we all experience. So I'm quite, I was quite keen to kind of almost protect my home life and my bubble at home, but actually we can't sanitize our lives and the impact of mo the modern world on people is that their mental health is affected by so much, whether that's at the moment, post COVID world, it's the cost of living, it's all of those challenges that we all face as, as human beings, it's the breakdown in, in societal structures, you know, marital breakdown, um, you know, social services imploding, that kind of thing. So the structures that we would have had perhaps once over to support us are, are probably by, by and large pretty much gone. Mm -hmm. So mental health is a massive issue. So the other photo there is simply me, um saying to, to my um one of my cover line yeah i said to my admin team listen go, go and get a brew and the funny thing about that big shout out to the royal scots that was my royal scots mug that arrived in the post and i was just papped by one of my um my admin my other admin team saying oh my god the boss is doing something <laughs> they were yeah. actually joking i do do a lot but it was a funny thing but nevertheless it exemplifies some small ways that we can as leaders just step in and help out and give people yeah, so for context now this picture you know i've lived this picture that uh, vic's got here on the right um <laughs> probably 6.30 in the morning for a good three or four years, man, man in the cover line where you've got staff calling in sick mm -hmm. and then you're having to deploy which teacher covers which class, which teaching assistant goes there and so on and so forth. And it's quite a, it's quite a stressful period of time, isn't it, Vic, to be fair? You know, early in the morning before your own day starts. Can I just say I'm rubbish at absolutely everything to do with doing that job. That exemplifies everything I'm rubbish at because this is what happened to me only yesterday. So a parent rang up with mid Ofsted and and some it was also census day today. So of course the admin team yeah. is slightly distracted preparing for census, not Ofsted, actual normal day to day running of the school. So I step in, I answer the phone. Hello, it's Woodlands Primary School. How, how can I help you? And um, a parent said, oh, I need to sort out something for my child's lunch. <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> idea how this works so i say not a problem i'll take a message and it'll all be sorted for you but honestly i was only grateful that they did not ask me a more challenging question than that right. because <laughs> I don't... you say i'm the head teacher i don't actually know <laughs> yeah i do actually say that you're asking the boss but i actually am clueless that i have a team of people around me to protect me from simple questions like this i'm there the idea squad <laughs> <laughs> now over to you um Mental health, we know it's a complex topic, but have you got anything you can share here with your own journey or things that might be changing in the military of late? So I, this is a really interesting topic today of all days, isn't it, with um, Jacinda Ardern um, uh, speaking as, uh, as passionately as she has. And there's nothing to say that um, the reasons behind her conversation are, are related to mental health issues necessarily. Um, but there's a lot of chat around burnout um, coming coming out of that. Um, and I think my my observation here is that um, when, when I have um, started to become uh, overwhelmed, I haven't seen it in myself. Other people have, have come down and sat me, sat me down and said, either I look tired, I'm stressed, therefore my behaviours are starting to become sort of a, a bit, erratic and, and inconsistent mm -hmm. um and so um absolutely rely on on the team around you to be able to make those observations and be open enough and transparent enough mm -hmm. as a leader to ask their opinion 
because my experience is that what as and when I have developed mental health issues it's other people that have spotted it before I spotted it myself that's a very very important point to make I think that's um something that we might all be a little bit guilty of Mm -hmm. um not seeing it in ourselves before others do so I guess it's equipping ourselves with those tools to be able to recognize the symptoms now Maybe this is a neat connection, Vic. Chapter 13, Body and Soul. Give us a, a synopsis of what happens here. So sometimes we, I'm guilty of this and perhaps other people are. Um, I love exercise. I do it for its own sake. I've done it all my life since I was a child. Um, as far back as primary school when we would do races up and down the playground and I always had to be first. I, I kind of retain that competitive edge, but it's been more about a holistic enjoyment of being in the outdoors. Um, so that is an amazing day of kite flying um, with good old Mike Dev. And that was a run that I did around the Kelpies one night um, and moonlight run um, to raise money for charity. And um, those two things just bring me in touch with my mind and my body and my soul all being in the same place at the same time. Physical, usually physical activity, exercise, but definitely being in the outdoors. And, and just that clarity of, of thinking that being in the outdoors brings to me and doing exercise. And that's not because I am, again, superwoman. It's just because I know the benefits of exercise, both um, physically and also mentally. And then being in the outdoors is another layer. You know, I, I have a gym at the end of my garden. I sound like I'm, I'm really rich. I'm not. It, it's in an old um, shed. <laughs> but it's got. It's fully equipped, and I love it. I, pictures, and you are in there every day, so that's good. So I can contest <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> Most days I'm in there. Um, but yeah, it just brings me that that peace of mind. And I know, you know, maybe I'm an endorphin junkie, I don't know. But I certainly think doing exercise, whether that's walking, I, I, I've said in the book, walking with headphones on, I've become recently accustomed to listening to audio books, so I can kind of satisfy three or four different goals with one with one activity. And I know that sounds ridiculous, like why are you compartmentalizing your goals? But you have to think smart if you want to be a successful woman and a mum and you know a leader you have to think smart about your use of time and if i can i try and make my time work for me and, and hit several different um you know priorities yeah, I'll, tell you, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll use my opportunity to use my man brain a bit and my naivety as a young male leader working with lots of female teachers around me and then when i wasn't a parent not really understanding the challenges that parents teachers and then part-time parent teachers and the stresses that they went through and then maybe it was as I matured into leadership and saw a lot more people around me and got access to kind of human resource information that was confidential and sensitive and things and I suppose also when I had my own son and realizing the challenges it was for me who was pretty much playing a part-time role of being a father and a school leader and how efficient you have to be with your time whether it's exercising or actually doing a bit of extra work behind the scenes for whatever reason, it's um, incredibly difficult. Um, so I'm, I guess a message out there to lots of men, you know, take time to understand someone else's perspective. Uh, Mel, you've got a dog, so I assume you do lots of dog walking in your house, but what else do you do to keep fit or exercise? So um, I think being kind to yourself is one of the golden threads that I think goes through the, 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 the book beautifully. And th that is what this chapter is all about for me. It's about, um, actually, what do you do to, to, to maintain self? So absolutely um, walking the dog. Um, exercise, I take myself to extremes. I haven't run a marathon. I've walked a marathon. Oh, um, I, at the moment, I'm into, into my peloton, so I, I seem to sort of enjoy sort of getting on and, 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 and cycling. That's good. I need, to, I need to get on the bandwagon with peloton. I think I'm going to say one thing out loud because someone might hold me to account for it, but I really want to get into cold, cold water swimming. Mm -hmm. and, and I've got no excuse around Yorkshire because there's plenty of places where it's freezing, yeah. <laughs> plenty of places, plenty of bits of water. And my son has got into it, actually. He's only 11. He's doing cold water showers. He's already into the Wim Hof method. Uh, so we probably just need to find a time to go out and start mm -hmm. doing it. And um, Right, let's pop over to, so conscious of time, we're about seven minutes away from eight o'clock, but we're going to keep going until the end. We've got about three or four more chapters to go. Um, chapter 15, we've got all these pictures here. Vic, give us a, an overview of what's happening here. Okay, so um, 
my success story and how successful I am is not based on me. It's based enormously on a team, again, recognized tonight by Ofsted. Um, so what you can see there at the top, the two, those two gorgeous ladies, they're here in the background, desperate to celebrate with me this evening. That's my mum and my auntie. Um, they were instrumental, obviously, in my upbringing. Um, I love them both to bits. They're just incredible human beings and they're so supportive and have been all the way through. Uh, and then left and right, I nearly said of ARC, but that, but I don't need to say. And who's that. on the left here? Who's on the left, so, top left? So, so these guys, um, they're gorgeous. That's Ben and Sol. They're from actually from my military intelligence unit in Manchester. And we okay. all commissioned on the same day, which was just incredible. Yeah, um, very smart. And, yeah and for a change, I actually had my hair tidy. And on the right hand side, that right. they, those two guys, this is hilarious. So we were in a section together in Santa. So I'm the oldest there um, in the whole entire platoon by about 20 years. So these two yeah, boys. I love this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> These two boys are babies. They're in their 20s. Um, and they're, I don't know, six foot odd, six foot five, six foot six, massive. They were in my section. And so you can imagine how intimidated I felt looking at them. Yeah, thinking, but you ended up helping them, didn't but, you, to be fair? Yeah. So good old Timmy on the right hand side. He's gorgeous. He's my next door neighbor in, in, on the line. And he said his first thought when he saw me was that I would be the liability, that I would be the drag along in our section. And what he very quickly realized was that that was not the case. That was so cool. And I love him. He's great. And on right. the left, side, there, that's his words. <laughs> and on the bottom, and who are the ladies at the bottom? They are my team at work. And oh my God, they were all crying tonight. Um, the lady taking the photo isn't on it. She's called Cots. And. Oh. Um, You've got Sue and Sharon and Alice. And honestly, I love those women so much. I literally love them as if they were my own my own siblings. They're just great. And they've been on that journey with me since I joined the school. They wept this evening. It was great. And I am honestly successful because everything I do is part of being a team and knowing my role in that team and then working effectively in my role and to support my team. Those two key factors or what has meant everything about my success. And that is what I would definitely say. You cannot do it on your own and be successful. So on, on the theme of going together rather than solo, Mel, is there anything in your leadership career in the military where pairing up with somebody else or a team has allowed you, I mean, I suppose in the military and, or any industry, you have to work effectively as a team. But is there any standout moment where you switch from solo to teamwork? So I'm at the top of the organisation, um, as is um, as is Vic, and it can be a really lonely place. So um, I've had to embrace um, reverse mentoring um, as a tool to um, to learn and, and and seek some sort of solace on the on the on the on the bad days. Um, what I loved about that conversation, Vic, is your ability to love your colleagues. Mm -hmm. There is a there is a real commitment in in saying to colleagues, "I love you." Mm -hmm. And a, a junior officer said to me recently, because I use love a lot, he said, you know, do we use love a lot? Do we use the word love enough in leadership? And then you go and write a book on it. <laughs> I don't think we use it enough. Uh, love is about giving your whole self to your people mm -hmm. and your team. Mm -hmm. um, and the more, the more able you are able to do that, which is a little bit trust, isn't it? Um, then the better the team forms and the better is better the results. So, um, so yeah, love that, love that conversation there. Great. Now we've got two more to go. Reminder to people watching uh, currently live: you can pose your comments and your questions. So we've got Kimber still watching. Thank you. Teamwork makes everything easy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so we've got this next slide here, and um, this is obviously a, an era that we've all just lived through. So, uh, what's happening here, Vic? So here is about collaboration, formalizing it. So I've got my teams, my home team, my army team, um, you know, my work team. This is about collaborating externally to my to those teams that I know in real life. And I said earlier, social media has become huge um, as a tool for us to be able to collaborate with others. And if you haven't got, you know, if you run a small organization or if you're in a small school, you haven't got that. Um, peer support i mean mal just mentioned then it, it can be quite lonely as a leader well it can be but if you have that external collaboration with equal 
with your equals, with your peers, like-minded individuals, you can nevertheless gain that benefit. And this is education round tables. If you if you're listening on Twitter, yeah, I know Ben very well. Yeah, he's yeah Ben, superstar. Mm. Um, Matt Jessup's in there. Anthony McGinney, the lovely Angela. Um, so they're all people that I work closely with on education round tables. I've done tons of stuff. Um, where I've supported other people for free. And I feel like that is part, also underpinning my philosophy. You should help where you can help. So Ben brings head teachers together on various topics. And I guess he kind of steers the conversation and people take turns to do a bit of sharing privately. Is that That's the methodology, isn't it? Yeah, and he's building a growing profile there of resources and of support networks. He's, he's you know, it's grown exponentially since that day. Um, the worst person on there for doing that is Chris Dyson. You know, he some people love him, some people don't. But he's f very fond of a screenshot, and you're there as I am, looking very intently at the screen. Yeah. And he snapped you and it's posted. One of it. Screenshots, oh. is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Dyson. Um, but yeah, so but what that does show is that you know um, the collaboration is key, absolutely. Sure. Now, uh, now Mel, ha, ha, you know, lockdown. I guess in this context, this image has probably been uh, something we all experience. Can you think of a situation where you had to collaborate online through through lockdown, uh, and maybe give us a little kind of story of your your role in leadership? Yeah, so heavy sigh here because I I um I I have nineteen establishments across the across the UK. I came into into command, which necessitates a very personal uh, relationship with with four thousand people in the organisation. Right. To do that on a screen, um, it's really easy, <laughs> um, but you know, I mean, it was the revolution of COVID, wasn't it? Was the ability to network and mm. to and to bring people together much like this is you know it's fantastic this just wouldn't have happened two years ago um so i think it has been a it has been a revolution we've got to take the best bits of uh, online networking but let's not lose sight of the of the benefits of being in the room with people as well so there's a there's a balance that we're going to have to strike um as we come through um right, i've got a question here um what do I do in a team when I'm working or uh, people kind of drag me back that's that's the feeling new who's got here um and might come up with a better outcome one who loves to work with a team but's got a uh, problem uh, what solution so let's go to you mel first so think about you know that huge job you've just described you know 4000 colleagues 19 institutions what what wisdom would you give here for someone um you know play devil's advocate sometimes we might think we might have an idea but it might not be the right one and we might be upset or we might actually believe it to be the right scenario so give us a couple of solutions yeah, you've. Uh, put the, can you, are you able to put that question up again? I, that, that's confusing. Do you know what my immediate response to it? Because I, I, I'm drawn to sort of dragging me backwards. Um, it's always the case in groupthink where there is somebody that offers an alternative view, and if it isn't, if if it isn't your view, there is that perception that they're dragging you, dragging you back. But actually. If you go into that sort of conversation with a mindset that the challenge is actually there designed to sort of take you forwards, mm -hmm. just be really open minded to every perspective in the room and, and understand how you can work with it to um, to get a better, better solution. It's just about opening your mind, isn't it, to every every yeah. um, perspective in the room, I think. Um, something I'd recommend Nuhu to have a look at. And I've got a blog on my site if you're interested. And there's tons of stuff out there. But just do a little research into different types of cognitive biases. And it allows you to understand your own emotions to things that people do or say. Or when you do something, uh, how other people respond to you. And you can start to learn you know, that little bit of psychology about body language, response, delay, pause, how people talk to you, etc. Uh, Vic, any, uh, let me put that question back up there. A any thoughts on this one? I think teamwork, like living in a community, involves compromise and involves um, thought. And I think, as you say, sometimes I've had ideas, I've brought them to the team. Um, I thought it was a great idea, but actually the team have embellished those ideas and made them even better. And I, and I try always to think what I could have done better in terms of selling that idea, perhaps, or whether the team idea is, is a better idea than mine. And by and large, their ideas are usually better than mine because it's a collaborative effort. Um, so I, as you said, I would say kind of take on board the ideas of other people and, and use them as drivers to, to improving your own idea, really. 
So taking people's ideas on board. So uh, thank you, Nuhu, for sharing your question. Now we've got one more slide and we're going to wrap things up. So people watching, our last reminder, uh, log in to your platform that you're watching from, leave a question, I'll pop it on the screen like this, for Mel and Vic uh, to respond to. And just before I put this last slide up, let me just remind you why we're here. So uh, can you both grab your books and give us a little wave with what you've got on your I'll side? I'll pick so mine up off the gin bottle stand. <laughs> Watch the picture. <laughs> So new book, when was it published, Vic? It was before Christmas, just before Christmas. My daughter's birthday, my daughter's 18th birthday, November the 12th. Okay, so back in November, so still early. Uh, my book experience takes three or four uh, months or so for it to warm up when people really get a, a, a chance to get hold of it, talk about it, read it, and then respond. So we're kind of, re we're still in the early kind of uh, phase of the book book's life. Um, there's uh, 17 chapters, 17 chapters, great value for money, I have to say. And it's a nice <laughs> <way to go. laughs> I love and the cover. Was, I'm not joking. Was, when I got the hard copy, I thought, but the cover yeah, is yeah, so right. nice, isn't nice, it? I love it. Smooth, yeah. So good job there. So we've got, um, let me just put uh, just a recap just before we sum things up. We're doing a little virtual book launch for Vic to celebrate her life in leadership, leading with compassion and love. Uh, and you've got a little bio uh, here of Mel, who's joined us to talk about her own military career and leadership life as a mum. And same with Vic in how we both uh, or each have responded to challenges and adversity, but still managed to lead uh, lots of other people in our communities uh, with love and compassion. But we've got this last slide to finish, um, Vic. So slide 17 or chapter 17. So we've got uh, you in your uniform here on the left and then you're on the right in the school playground with a dog. Yeah. So um, I, did, I think this this might, both these things might resonate with Mel actually for different reasons. So on the left-hand side, um, I, I did my basic training some years ago now uh, in Exeter and it was completely alien to me. I'd never lifted up a weapon system in my life. Anyway, I found out it was, it was okay shot and that's because I was coached by an expert, um, Dan, Dan Mills, who wrote a book called Sniper One. He coached me for a whole day on those ranges, Bullford ranges, and, and I was really delighted. Um, but what it showed me was that you can learn new skills some quite technical specific challenging skills with the right coaching and the right support um and i love that basic training because it, it pushed me in so many ways um you'll have to read the book and even then it's only scratches the surface but um so that's um and then i i, I passed out basic training and i thought wow you know i've done that i was again i was the oldest by about 27 years people thought it was funny um at the start because why is this old lady doing this but but my challenge like mel said you know i've got a daughter i have got colleagues i have got friends who think that just because you hit the perimenopause or the menopause your life is over it's game over you're no longer useful or valuable to society and I thought, I am actually, and I never let age affect me. Uh, I never well, let... I, I read some stats lately. So, um, you know, I, I've been reading up on the menopause, actually, and also I've discovered as a result that actually women in their 50s is the, the I believe it's the most growing age group in terms of the workforce, I believe. Yeah. And maybe yeah. that's true to, a lot, you know, menopause policies, things like that, flexible working hours. Well, I think yeah, it's interesting yeah. because um, I'm a woman, obviously, and, um, you know, I, I'm in that perimenopausal phase and I knew nothing about it until recently. I don't watch much telly, as we've already established, but my Audible, which I've become more accustomed to using, suggested that I listen to Davina McCall's book, Menopausing. And honestly, it's been a game changer for me. So I'm making sure all my colleagues know about it. I think I should download it and get some copies for my male colleagues so that they're aware of their female mums, their partners, their sisters, how that affects them. And also so that they can signpost support for them because so many women leave their jobs in their 50s because of menopausal constraints, which I just simply wasn't aware of. Now, I'm on HRT. I'm not afraid to say it happened for over a year. And it's been a game changer for me for reasons which I didn't even know. I thought I was ill. I thought I had maybe um, COVID because I was having these hot you know flush moments or my heart was racing and I thought am I developing an illness I was quite concerned actually when I spoke to my doctor she's very good at, and this is not everyone's experience and I think again 
if we are influential people, which leadership um, individuals are, then we should be promoting these key messages to people. And therefore, whilst I am a female in the perimenopause, I think every leader should be saying, are you aware of this? This is a thing that affects women at this age, because so many women have been leaving um, their profession. You know, in, in one of one example, I'll give you a woman in the police force. She left after a very successful career because of effects of perimenopause. And that's a real shame. You, you know, if you don't harness this and embrace it and support women going through this very natural phenomenon, then you're going to lose an awful lot of experience and expertise and um, you know, yeah, real skill. In time, haven't we? You know, considering that you know many industries led by uh, males, and we're talking about menopause a bit more. I suppose it's still early days with menopause policies. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so quite some way to go still. And I guess that point about buying copies for your male colleagues probably a very good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, sown that seed. Um, Mel, what are your thoughts? So I went through early menopause in my in my in my mid forties, and like Vic, I, I I I had to go look at the retrospective and and really sort of understand what on earth was happening to me, uh -huh. um, and, and then sort of went on to HRT for for seven eight years before I before I sort of came through the other the other side. It's definitely a, a hot topic, and you know you often find that women um, progress to. These sort of senior positions around the same time as they're as they're hitting their yeah. and and now at least we're able to sort of talk about it and understand how we can how we can best manage it and we've got people like me that have experienced that can look back now and say well this is what I would do you know this the same or differently but definitely policy is catching up with us I mean there's a whole session there on menopause alone isn't it? yeah I agree awareness raising awareness of the symptoms some of the symptoms even as a woman you're not aware of because everyone's different of course they are yeah. but given that we're 51 percent of the population I think it's really important to be aware of it even if it doesn't affect you necessarily personally physically being aware of it is going to be beneficial well, I, I got a question I'd like to ask you is, you know, what, um, you know, going through the menopause early, how did it impact your career, I suppose, at uh, uh, an earlier age than you would expect, uh, would have expected personally? So it impacted negatively because it started to impact um, and change my behaviours in the workplace. Um, and just at a time when I was wanting to assert myself as, as a senior leader, um, I talk about that consistency in my branding. It was really difficult to be um, to be to be consistent, um, and so I, I learned some hard lessons in those years because I think if I if I knew then what I know now, I would have been more um, insistent with the organisation that they needed to understand the reasons for for some of those um, for some of those fluctuations. Um, and I'd have been more able to talk to my colleagues and help them understand what was happening um, because I didn't necessarily understand it myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's a yeah. good point to finish on. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, now I'm going to put these pictures back up because I think this is a nice way to finish, you know, playground to parade ground. Okay. And I guess this is you, you know, without your um, – Exercise pictures, Vic. I guess this best sums up your kind of day-to-day -day life and what you're doing behind the scenes as a as a reservist. Uh, and a, a bit of a kind of juxtaposition of pictures. Well, uh, there's lots of similarities, I suppose. But um, we could unpick this as a doctorate degree. These two pictures. Um, <laughs> lots, lots going on here. Um, but if I just pop back to the title slide, so we'll just do one last book plug. So, ladies, give give us a, a wave with your books on your side. So. Leading with love uh, for leaders, <laughs> um, compassionate leadership. Uh, let me just put that back up here. So title slides. I was, I was lucky enough to talk to Vic about her writing this book uh, before it came to publication. We went through all the highs and lows together. And it's nice to have it holding it. And uh, I, I guess I got a quote from the back of the book uh, in, in the conclusion I'd like to finish with. And I'll ask you both for just a concluding thought. And I'll end up. I'll end with my review. But here's the here's how Vic ends the book. So, leading with love matters. It matters that the interpersonal capabilities of school leaders and their interpersonal abilities make positive impact on members of and the ethos within their schools. Love, after all, is what it's all about. So, uh, Mel, let's come to you first. Any concluding thoughts? I was very struck. Um... 
I've 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 numbered my my lessons in this one thing. Um, <laughs> I was, very, I was very struck at how many of them um, come back to that theme around being kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's really important that you take time to time to in, time to invest in self. And if you if you're able to do that, then then it all comes good. But this is where you introduce imposter syndrome um, towards the towards the end of the book. And that's do you know what I mean. That's what's that's what's coming in the next one, Vic, isn't it? Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> I've got a question. For you, so I suspect a lot of females will be interested in this book, but why do you think a man should pick up a copy of this book and buy one? What What would you say, um, Mel? Oh, I really struggle to to deal with sort of gender questions because I don't think I don't think male or female. I just kind of think that I could go and read them with love, full stop. And yeah, and absolutely. Do you know what this This isn't a book for a girl. It's it's a book that everybody should read. Yeah, absolutely. I spoke to more male colleagues about it than women, actually. <laughs> Oh, there you go. What a great response. Thank you. Uh, Vic, over to you. Final thoughts. Uh, I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to share some of those things with people. And um, hopefully it's benefited people who've read it. And if you haven't read it, then hopefully um, something about this evening has encouraged you to read it. It's just a story of how anyone can do it. And if I can do it, anyone can, including you. So, so we're not going to delay things any further. Thank you to those people still watching live. Uh, if you're Thanks, watching this Brad. recorded, um, give us a shout. Uh, you can follow uh, Vic on Twitter. What's your handle? Happyhead74? At, at Happyhead74 or on LinkedIn, Mel. it's Dr. Victoria Carr. And Mel, what's your Twitter name? I haven't got it to hand. I, I tagged you earlier. as C. Yeah. Mel Robinson. Is that the one? So I'm, I'm at Commodore Mel Robinson, and we abbreviate Commodore to C-D-R-E. C-D-R-E. Okay, C-D-R-E, Mel Robinson on Twitter. So let's uh, give a little shout-out to our ladies uh, taking part here. Pick their brains. Uh, grab a copy of the book in all your good bookstores. Um, and I'm, I'm sure... <laughs> yeah, Amazon, if you want to, uh, you know, damage the planet with all their overpackaging and recycling. Um, and I'm sure Vic will be doing some webinars and some training events at some point in, in the future. But right now, she needs a rest. Uh, <laughs> right now, she her. needs more champagne. <laughs> and she's just gone through off bed, and we're going to leave her be. But thank you, ladies, both for your wisdom and your time. Thank you. Uh, keep thank inspiring you, uh, us men as well as everyone else in our uh our sectors and reforming leadership and being a great role model. So thank you. Uh, thank and you. I shall see you soon. Thanks. All right. Bye everyone. Thank you for your time, everybody. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>